Joker steps over the line. Good. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. Bill, there's a column in The Hollywood Reporter by a Stephen Galloway uh, comparing Joker, the new movie starring Joaquin Phoenix, um, in ways with A Clockwork Orange uh, from 1971, sure. which was at the time condemned uh, by a lot of people who thought it was practically pornography. It actually earned an X Got rating, an X rating yeah, at yeah. that time. Um, but Galloway kind of buries the lead, in a sense, in this opinion piece in... Um, in the hollywoodreporter.com and uh he asked the question and then answers it uh has was warner brothers right to make it and i just want to get your reaction um to what he says about this he says yes they were right to make it because art has an enormous beneficial impact on society even when it skirts the risk of doing harm it makes us question reconsider reevaluate it shakes us as much as it suckers us makes us uncomfortable as much as it makes us comfortable it sinks deep in our hearts and minds and changes us forever and the more unsettling it is the more likely it is to have an effect what do you think of that concept of uh, vigorous, almost pornographic violence as art, Bill? Duh. I mean, what a remarkable, earth-shaking statement that art is meant to provoke thought and, and feeling and emotions and not necessarily positive ones. That's a profound insight on the part of that guy. Um, and another indication of how far we've fallen as a society and why I'm convinced that this cannot last. But we've fallen because this idea has to be explained to people. Is that what you're saying? We've fallen. Yeah, precisely right. Just the fact that somebody has to has to write an article about this. And, and not only that, but the presumptuousness of either they or anyone else saying deciding whether or not this film should have been made. You know, that doesn't have a it doesn't have a bit of a of a of a kind of a kind of funny smell to it to you. We have decided that this film shouldn't be made. It's not your decision whether this film should have been made or not. It's the decision of the people that made the movie, whether they want to make the film or not. What an absolutely arrogant, absolutely uh, authoritarian thing to say. Hmm, well, we are having a serious debate about whether or not Joker should have been made. What? What country is this? I know a country it used to be. Um, I don't know what their objections to, to Joker are is I suspect it's that they treat the Joker as a very serious case in terms of really for the first time getting past the comic book aspect of the Joker and really understanding how a, a, a person could could turn to that kind of evil. That's but right. If, and there's also, uh, he specifically mentions two scenes, one of which I'll, 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 I'll briefly mention is that there is a, a point blank range gunshot uh, into somebody's head that apparently was uh, so viscerally gruesome that the audience uh, just was completely shocked by it, uh, which is hard to do with modern audiences. So yep. yeah, it's a combination of it is portraying in some ways, uh, not a sympathetic portrait, but a realistic portrait of this character who's mentally ill and because of the just extraordinary graphic violence. Um. A couple of years ago, I saw a film called The Master starring Joaquin Phoenix, who's who's playing the Joker. And, um, oh my gosh, I've forgotten his name. He died not too too long ago. Uh, it'll come to me. One of those three named actors. He's an incredible actor. And, and I've never seen acting like it. And then Joaquin Phoenix walks on the stage, so to speak. Uh, uh, Philip Michael... I'm practically Amish. You're not going to get the so, name out uh, of yeah, me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize to his fans out there. Uh, uh, Philip Hoffman. I should know this. I, I, I certainly have the face. I apologize. But in any event, he's a superb actor. He won an Academy Award for his role in Capote. And, and he Philip is one Seymour of the best. Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Thank you. I started to look it up and then it came to me, believe it or not. Thank you. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, and and, um, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix are in that movie. And Philip Seymour Hoffman is putting in the performance of a lifetime. He's so excellent. And then when Joaquin Phoenix actually gets on the screen, you realize that Joaquin Phoenix is doing something that I've never seen before. Uh, I'm a theater major. I've, I've studied acting. I've seen a lot of performances, directed a lot of performances, and I have never seen acting like I saw coming from Joaquin Phoenix in, in The Master. It was simply 
it was it was simply the, the highest bar I've ever seen in terms of the of the of the just the this absolutely essence of, of maintaining this character throughout the entire film and every single reaction was just spot on perfect. So when they mentioned when they announced that Joaquin Phoenix would be playing the Joker, I knew that this was not going to be a cartoon Joker. Now there's the Cesar Romero cartoon Joker, of course, and everybody doesn't, no one takes that seriously, need to say. There's the Jack Nicholson Joker. Nobody took him seriously, needless to say. And of course, there's the um, the most recent Joker, uh, which was so profoundly well done in the Dark Knight trilogy. Heath Ledger. But never, yes, but nevertheless, is still essentially a cartoon character. He's he's got his moments when he's got his knife out when he's threatening, but when he's walking away from the uh, hospital in the nurse's outfit and the, and the detonator doesn't work, it's genuinely funny, genuinely funny, but it's also that that becomes a cartoon. It's a cartoon Joker. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is is not a cartoon, and the reason I'm speaking as a screenwriter here. The reason that you had to show that head explode was because you had to show consequences that actually mattered on a scale that people can comprehend. So while Heath Ledger's Joker may be blowing up buildings or, or burning down entire cities or, or gunning down gangsters or whatever the case may be, none of that is real violence. That's all screen violence, distant violence. You never really saw him he takes the criminal and pops him down on top of the pencil, which was another brilliant piece of work. But that's not that's not shocking. That's not violence. I suspect I'm almost positive the reason that they went to the trouble to show that particular headshot in the kind of gory detail that it apparently was filmed. And I haven't seen the movie was because when you shoot somebody in the head at point blank range, it's a bloody mess. Bill, you're now and, getting to the heart of what Stephen Galloway says. And let me so, just so, uh, since, let you so let me just say just, just, just since I haven't heard what he has to say, I don't want to be accused of, of stealing his, his his idea. What what that kind of a shot accomplishes is it, it 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 punches the audience in the guts. And you have to do that in a serious film. You can't just kind of you can't just kind of werewolf scare him like you could with Heath Ledger's Joker. You've got to you've got to make people just genuinely suddenly shockingly dread this man, dread him because because of that. And the only way you can hit that level of emotion, that level of, of disgust and repulsion is to see the actual consequences. If he just shot a guy and the guy went, oh, and fallen down to the ground, you wouldn't have thought anything about it. It would have been cartoon violence. But this is the first time in my awareness, and I'm not a big comic book guy, but this certainly seems to me to be the first time that I can think of that a comic book character is being treated like he's not a comic book character. And that is that is at the heart of what Stephen Galloway is saying here. He, he basically says that the violence uh, sickens us, it nauseates us, it repulses us to our very core, and that he... Galloway prefers this kind of violence in a movie to the kind of violence that seems to celebrate uh, that kind of gore. And let me read this quote, and uh, here it is from Stephen Galloway. Joker has the power to do this more, uh, I'm sorry, to do this and more because it's razor sharp in its morality. The film's quote, hero is a psychopath, psychologically warped, misinterpreting everything he sees, and of that we are never in doubt. Only a crazy person would want to emulate this guy, the kind of crazy person who doesn't need Joker to tip him into action. He is That's referring nice back said. to a mention that he made of how when The Dark Knight Rises came out, there was that shooting in the theater that coincided with the uh, with the showing of that picture. Um, Bill, it is, uh, it's a jarring thing to hear somebody say that this gruesome violence is razor sharp morality that makes a clear delineation between right and wrong. Yeah, about time. We we see um, we're desensitized to violence in movies and video games because we don't see the consequences of the violence. Somebody goes two two two, and a guy falls down. You know, 
you don't see his guts hanging out there. You don't see his head, back of his head blown off and you don't see the grieving children. You don't see any of it. It's just poo poo, down he goes. So it's, it's a sanitized form of violence and it, and it desensitizes us to real violence. And when we're confronted with the actual consequences of real lethal violence, it punches us in the gut and it should. And if it ever stops doing that, we're lost. Um, this brings us up to the, I think probably the main point about why he's having this uh, this discussion in the first place and why he would say things like, should this movie have been made or not? It comes down to the issue of whether or not movies like this affect people in the real world, whether or not movies like this can push somebody over the edge to become uh, a mass shooter or just a homicidal maniac or, or just plain murder his girlfriend or whatever the case is. And he may says be. there's no scientific evidence that that there is isn't. true. There isn't. There isn't. But to say that they're but to say that they're not related is also a mistake. Uh, I listened to this would be about two weeks ago now. I listened to Ted Bundy's last interview with uh, Dr. Dobson on death row about 15 hours before uh, Bundy was executed. And Ted Bundy's a very articulate guy. Ted Bundy got away with the horrific crimes he did because he's very articulate, because he's very uh, well-spoken and, and, and seems to actually be kind of, kind of a gentle guy. And James Dobson is the head of Focus on the Family, a Christian ministry based in Colorado that has a nationwide correct. radio yes. audience. And, and, and um, Ted Bundy asked him to, to come and speak to him before uh, Bundy was executed. Um, but here's what's so remarkable about that interview. Uh, and I was listening to a psychological analysis of that interview. Bundy starts off by saying, look, let me just start by saying one thing. I, I, I didn't come from a monstrous family. There was no abuse in my family. I wasn't locked up in a basement. I wasn't beaten with a tire iron. None of that. I had good parents. And, and one of the hardest things about this whole thing for me is, is how, how people must be wondering about what kind of parents they were. They were great parents. At this point, the person cut in and said, that automatically means that Ted Bundy is not a psychopath because psychopaths don't care about anybody. The idea of having remorse even for anybody is just not something they're capable of. But to the point, to the point, what Bundy said was, was that violent pornography was something that he became connected to early and that he became addicted to and that violent pornography desensitized him in a way. And here's the here's that Bundy went to enormous lengths to make this point clear. He said, I want to be crystal clear about this because I want people to understand how I became what I am. He said, violent pornography did not make me kill those women, but it was the indispensable element in that chain. In other words, if you take the violent pornography out of Ted Bundy's life, then Ted Bundy wouldn't have killed anybody. That's of, that may sound like a razor thin difference, but it's not. It's, it's the entire, entire issue right there. These kind of things there, I don't believe there's a video game or a movie that t makes somebody go out and kill somebody. Obviously, even somebody unstable doesn't. You know what? I was thinking about whether or not I'd shoot that school up. But now, having seen the Joker, I've decided I'm going to do it. That it just doesn't work that way. What does happen is, is that people who are, who are deeply disturbed can find in a long series of, of, of violent movies a, a sort of a a sort of a satisfaction, kind of an adrenaline rush, a, a, you know, maybe even a dopamine rush that over a long period of time begins to associate with them with some kind of pleasure. And so while the movie does not make the murderer, if you take the violence out of that murderer's life, you don't get the murderer. That was a profound, a profound insight. He, call, he I wrote it down. He called it the indispensable element. It was the one link in the chain that had you removed it, Ted Bundy wouldn't have wouldn't have killed anybody. And the distinction but, between that and the Joker is, uh, at least I've not seen the Joker either, so I'm going on Stephen Galloway's description, is the fact that that kind of violent pornography was not made in a way that would generate a sense of revulsion by the audience. Whether it did, or it would have certainly generated a sense of revulsion among among people of, of normal morality in this country. They would have been. But it was designed to appeal to a certain group of people who would have found it was, that uh, it was, endearing it was designed, or pleasant. No, it was it was designed to appeal to people whose whose um, interest and addiction to pornography had been sated by traditional uh, pornography, and since they had seen so much 
just traditional pornography in order to get that rush they had to go for, it's it's like any other kind of an addiction it's like you, you, yeah, you increase you the dosage you have to keep you have to keep increasing the dosage that's right and so we're seeing more and more and more pornography that's getting more and more and more further out there and more uh even more debased because there is so much base level pornography available and and bundy said this is what happened to him so so this this is the essence of the argument, and, and this is why I think there's a clear answer to this argument. Um, whatever you want to say about pornography in, in, in terms of its social value, or whatever you want to say about video games in terms of their social value, or whatever you want to say about violent movies in terms of their social value, the fact is, is that we cannot live our lives so that the most badly damaged people on the planet are not ever driven to, uh, or, or not even driven to, are not are not encouraged in any way to, to commit these acts. In other words, if you were to say that a guy were to say, look, I uh, the video games didn't make me shoot people, but I got to the point where I was shooting people so often I got used to it. Essentially what Bundy was saying about pornography didn't make me do it, but if it hadn't had been there, I wouldn't have done it. But if, if all that didn't do? exist, basically you'd have killers who were blaming the puritanical banality of mundane existence. Perhaps. Uh, I do believe, Bundy, in this particular case, I do believe that if that had not been there uh, and, and, and locked into his personality, he wouldn't have become the person that he was. But, but put that aside. That is not a reason to ban any of this stuff. There may be other reasons to ban it, but that's not a reason to ban it. You can't, because what it does, Scott, is it does the one thing that we conservatives are complaining about all the time, and that is it punishes the innocent for the actions of the guilty. If we agree, if we believe that, that outside influences can cause people to commit crimes that heinous, then what we are doing is we are agreeing to the principle that we are essentially automatons who are influenced by our environment and our and our are basically subject to forces beyond our control. Uh, utterly reject that, that view of human beings. Absolutely and utterly reject it. I believe that people have choice. I believe there have been people who've been raised under such appalling conditions and so badly damaged that their, that their actual chance to choose anything normal or decent was essentially eradicated at birth. And, and, and that needs to be understood. But basically, the idea that we have to remove anything that might upset or encourage anybody is to live in a society where we all stay in our bedrooms with the doors locked and and we eat our soil and green and we watch the paint dry. Freedom is the ability to determine for yourself what you want to do, what you want to see, what you want to think about and, and what you want to make out of all of these experiences. And freedom requires on that level, freedom requires some discipline, requires some sense of being an adult. And this is why, and I think this is the most important point, this is why it's important to isolate children from these things while they're children. Children should not be watching pornography. Children should not be playing extremely violent video games. And children certainly shouldn't be going to movies like the Joker, because they're children, because they have simple things to learn before they can learn the more complex things. I started out in video games when before they even had a video screen. I started out with a teletype Star Trek game on a, on a piece of green and white uh, printer paper. So by the time we got to video games with the graphic ability to show just people being gunned down in absolute realism, I'd already developed a moral code and probably around age five or six, I decided murdering people wasn't a good idea. So. So while we can, while my personal position is, and I think the, 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 the freedom position is, is that free people should be able to do and see what they want to, so long as there's no harm being done to other people by it. But children are in fact a special case and to, and to weaken the protection of children, which we're seeing everywhere, 
is exceedingly damaging, exceedingly damaging. For young children to see these levels of violence and this level of pornography that any five-year-old, six-year-old can just go out on the web, doesn't matter what kind of web blockers, you know, it, it's no, it's everywhere. I cannot imagine how that would have changed me, my friends, all of my entire youth and childhood, and it's not a good thing. But to say that it needs to be banned or controlled or that film not made is to grant the, the progressive premise that we're essentially robots that are that are that are simply acting out according to the dictates of what society tells us to do and i find that view of people to be disgusting and and immoral and just plain wrong delving deeply into the morality of the culture the members at billwhittle.com have made it possible for us to have these kind of in-depth conversations five days a week in addition to the other programming at billwhittle.com completely funded or let's say completely with a little bit of help from youtube but not much completely funded by the members at uh, billwhittle.com we are grateful for their help in creating this program we invite you to become one of them by going to billwhittle.com and clicking that become a member link for bill whittle i'm scott Thank you.